Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, to Quantify's seventh annual uh, risk conference. Uh, my name is Rowan Douglas. I'm CEO of Quantify. Uh, Quantify does next generation trading, risk, and analytics uh, for the capital markets. Um, we host conferences like, like this to uh, provide an open forum for uh, market participants to discuss uh, issues that are relevant. Um, today we have two sessions. Uh, the first session uh, will explore the drivers behind the growth of fixed income ETFs. Uh, the second session will focus on the IBOR transition uh, and what this means to, to all market participants. So two uh, very relevant subjects um, in the market today. Uh, after the two panels, we'll, we'll have a uh, drinks at 6.30, which I hope you can stay for. Um, please note a couple of things. First of all, the views and opinions expressed by the speakers are those of the individuals and not representative of their respective companies. Uh, also, during the session, if you could please make sure your uh, mobile phones are on silent. Um, so I'd now like to introduce the first panel, the Rise of Fixed Income ETFs, moderated by Anand Venkatraman Tram Anand. Uh, head of ETF Investment Strategies at uh, Legal and General. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm quite excited to be here with my fellow panelists. Just uh, quickly introduce myself first before passing it on to my uh, panelists, and then we'll get straight into the discussion from there on. So my name is Anand Venkatraman, and I work literally across the street at Legal and General, look after the investment strategy side of things within the ETF business. Um, got into Legal and General as part of an acquisition um, that uh, Elgin made last year. Uh, our team of 10 and a bunch of you, its fund was acquired from a firm called ETF Securities. And uh, it's kind of business as usual since, uh, I'd say, since we got acquired last year. We're trying to build new products and, and get on with it. So I'll pass it on to Brett. Sure. We've got Brett, Tom, and Mark, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Sure. My name is Brett Olson, and I'm responsible for the fixed income ETF business um, at BlackRock with the NYSHARES uh, business. Um, I've been there six years. Um, I was hired from the sell side from a fixed income uh, sales role to really drive uh, forward the fixed income ETF uh, business, taking a look at you know, driving client adoption, innovating and commercializing product, and then how do we make sure we evolve the ecosystem? Uh, my name is Tom Stevens. I'm the International Head of ETF Capital Markets at JP Morgan Asset Management. Uh, I've been there for just about two years now, where we started our own uh, USITS ETF uh, range about two years ago as well. Uh, previous to that, I was uh, 10 years at Society General, where I was the European Head of ETF Execution. My name is Mark Fitzgerald. I work at Vanguard. Uh, I've been there, I've been here about six years. Um, currently, uh, I work in the product management team. Um, think of us as, as product specialists, so we help out with uh, some of the product governance aspects of, of running uh, usage platforms and usage products, but also with our internal education and, uh, and general education with uh, external parties, hence participation at panels like this. My background uh, before product management was actually product development at, at Vanguard, where um, I oversaw the development of some of our uh, equity and fixed income ETFs. And prior to that, I was a fund manager at BlackRock. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, before I get into the first question, I'd just like to set the scene and give you a little bit of background. Maybe start off by talking about what's really happened so far this year in the fixed income markets. Uh, I was just reading an article last week from uh, say Business Insider where they, they mention about how the fund flow gap between equities and, and fixed income hasn't been you know, this high since the credit crisis in 2008. Um, so clearly, when you look at the gap of, of the flows between US um, North American uh, equities and Gavis, it's been the highest in, in the last 10 years. But apart from that, there have been quite a few, few, few other interesting, um, I would say, facts that I'd like to just touch upon. In the corporate space, in the credit space, we've seen a spike. Last year, there was a net outflow of just about three, three to four million billion dollars. But then this year, there's been a sharp increase to about $41 billion. When you look at the ultra low and ultra short and the short segment of, of the bonds, you, you've seen a net outflow this year uh, when compared to the recent past. Um, whereas if you look at the longer duration, the 10 year plus or the likes of tilts and so on, there's been a net increase in flow. So people clearly moving away from the near end 
and allocating more towards the you know, longer term. When, when it comes to, say, mortgage-backed securities, moonies and, and preference shares, it's been more or less stable over the last few years, and 2019 has been reflecting some of those uh, characteristics. And inflation-protected um, space has been pretty slow this year so far when compared to the recent past, but, but we do receive, um, you know, we've been seeing um, substantial interest from clients for those kind of uh, sort of say pure inflation break-even exposures as well. But with that, you know, it's, it's quite exciting to be in, in the space at the moment. Oh, we hear a lot of, uh, you know, of people saying, oh, we, we are switching into a cautious environment. Uh, it could be risk off. Gold has seen record inflows this year on, on the back of risk off sentiment. Um, and, and, and it kind of plays or sort of bodes well for fixed income investment. And maybe that leads on straight away to our first question as to what's driving the growth in, in, in bond ETFs. So I'll maybe start with Brett. Sure. And, and I think we need to actually kind of step back and pause and think about how is the overall ETF, um, bond ETF market evolved over time. And, and when we looked at it this year, there's a big milestone achieved. 17 years post the launch of the fi first fixed income ETF, the global market for fixed income ETFs crossed the, bill, uh, the trillion dollar mark. So really impressive. What's even more impressive is looking at the trajectory that we've seen over the past five years and therefore the anticipated trajectory that we see going forward. Um, many of us, including BlackRock and some, some other providers, are looking at it and thinking that it will double uh, in size over the next five years. So 17 years to get to a trillion, but another five to get to, to two trillion. And you know, there are a number of things driving that. We can talk about what have been the tailwinds. Um, there have been some headwinds uh, at different points in time over the last 17 years. But when you think about some, some of the big tailwinds we've seen that have helped propel this, um, search for yield has been key. Focus on cost has been key. MIFID II, transparency, that's critical as well. Um, so that would be where I'd kind of try to start it with and maybe hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Uh, I mean, a lot of that resonates with, with our clients uh, as well. And um, recently, we conducted a, a, a global survey, a global ETF survey. And you know, some of the things that we saw come back in those answers was uh, cost control in terms of using fixed income ETFs instead of broader bond portfolios, um, the liquidity of those particular fixed income ETFs uh, you know, listed in the US, listed uh, in, in Europe and how they can you know, get market access to those particular products yeah. and that ease of trading, you know, the exchange traded nature of, of the uh, fixed income ETF instrument as opposed to what has historically been uh, you know, very much OTC market in, in the fixed income space. So there's that and then there's also diversification. So if you're trying to access a particular part of, of the bond market, whether that be uh, dollar hard currency or you know, aggregate wider broad uh, indices or um, you know, dollar EM as well, different parts of the rates curve. There's, there's been a lot of interest to, across, the, across the whole kind of bond spectrum. I think the interesting part, just to add on to that, when we think about the OTC nature or the uh, on exchange trading of ETFs, when we go back before MIFID II required the reporting of, of trades, uh, we still don't have a perfect um, tape as the U.S. have. But when we look at it, you know, we used to guesstimate that maybe about a third was uh, done on exchange, two-thirds off. I think I would argue it's closer to 25% is done on and the rest still off exchange, even though they're called exchange-traded funds. The European market is just developed slightly differently than the U.S. market. I think part of that is due to the fractured nature of the, the trading, the exchanges themselves, um, versus in the U.S. it seems to be much more centralized. Um, but the markets are slightly different, so slightly nuanced from that perspective. Yeah, and I think all three of us are trying to make sure that that, that uh, kind of 75-25 split is harmonized a little bit. We'd like to see more uh, volumes uh, and printed and, and in a lit uh, and transparent way. Yeah, I mean, just building on what the guys have said, if we think about what might drive this growth of adoption or whether it's a push or a pull, some of that is regulatory, some of that is, is continued uh, understanding of the importance of costs and the, the, the part that indexing plays in all of this and reducing your cost as an investor. Um, there's also the, uh, I think what we find is when we talk to uh, uh, investors about equities and, and fixed income, fixed income can be more difficult perhaps for people to grasp in the sense that they're generally more comfortable with equities. 
And so what we're finding is investors are, are becoming more aware of the flexibility that uh, fixed income ETFs offer um, in terms of executing uh, large baskets of trades uh, very efficiently. But you know, to step right back a second, let's just take the big picture here. Over the last 10 years, $1.4 trillion has moved out of active strategies and into index strategies. So there's been a massive shift from active into index. And the ETF world is part of that massive shift. So you're seeing a huge growth in, in equity index, a fixed income index, and then a huge growth also in a, a, a trajectory um, that, you know, to, to Brett's point, we could, we could see a, a doubling again in, in Europe of, uh, of ETF assets in a very short space of time. This, this is a momentum that we expect to continue, but it's part of a, of a broad very large shift in how the world actually views investing. And uh, as we do more of these sorts of events and we, we get to explain to investors the flexibility um, that the ETFs can bring um, and the choice and the, the, the ease of execution, um, we expect to see that adoption continue. And, and think about starting with just portfolio construction. I think there's a greater focus on your know, actual portfolio construction, what are the drivers of returns based on the outcomes people are looking to achieve? And you, know, you hear the active and indexing comments. Um, I think most of us would argue you, know, you basically, there's an active decision making process used for whatever tool or instrument you use within a portfolio, um, depending on how you construct it. And you're taking an active decision to use index products or alpha seeking products, be that you know just normal unlevered funds, out to hedge funds, alts, liquid alts, whatever it might be. So I think that's also been you know, one of the big drivers as people get more comfortable as well with bond ETFs. If I go back, you know, when I started from coming in from a sell side seat in fixed income in, in the bond space, um, if, when I went out and started talking to the people I had covered beforehand about fixed income ETFs, half of them would shut the door on me. They didn't want to talk about it. They didn't really want to hear about it. Then the other half, 20, well, half of the other half, so 25% in total, thought, okay, this is interesting. I want to understand how this could potentially evolve and how it could have maybe helped me, but I'm not too sure. And then there was another 25% of the total 100 who were thinking, okay, this might actually make me more efficient longer term, and it really had to evolve. And that evolution took a lot of work from all of us uh, from the market's perspective of not just working with the investors, and getting them to think, and in particular, I would argue the bond buyers, the active portfolio managers, not just getting them to think about how they can use a bond ETF as a tool in their portfolio for um, liquidity purposes or liquidity sleep purposes or replacement for cash, um, but, but really thinking about um, how all of this is evolving and can actually make them outperform longer term. Um, and then you also had to speak with the broker dealers. So if you think about the trading of ETFs, it's an equity wrapper, right? And so that's why I think it's harder for people to grasp bonds sitting in an equity wrapper traded on the Delta One desk in equities. So a lot of us spent quite a bit of time working with, okay, that's great you're trading them there, but we need to get the involvement of the EM traders, the high yield traders, the IG traders, the Govies traders involved in that process as well. Otherwise, it wasn't going to evolve the right way. So you're kind of climbing two ladders at the same time. I would argue to the point where today, you know, six years ago, most active PMs weren't thinking about fixed income ETFs, to be perfectly frank. Even I think that within BlackRock, um, that was my first task was how do I convince BlackRock active, uh, fundamental active portfolio managers to use them as a tool. I'm, we're not trying to replace you, we're trying to make you more efficient. But that was a big hurdle. And I would argue today, most traders, if you're trading high yield, you'll have some of the high yield ETFs on your screen and you're trying to watch what's happening in the marketplace that, with the that's ETFs. A really good point. We've had some dialogue recently with our active uh, fixed income uh, portfolio managers in the US. Uh, it's not often fully understood, but uh, Vanguard is known for indexing, but we actually have a, a large active business. And in, in the US, there's around $450 billion of active fixed income uh, products managed at Vanguard, and the traders and the portfolio managers, to your point, are using ETFs as you know, liquidity tools. They're using them to take short-term positions to adjust the portfolios. So it doesn't have to be a, an, an argument or a debate about should I be indexed or active. It's actually how do you combine 
the two, and can these products, the beauty of an ETF is you could use it as a, as a core buy and hold position, or you can use it in a tactical way to fine tune positions and, as I say, use it as a liquidity tool. Because if you think about it, the difficulty of now trying to trade lots and lots of individual bonds and individual securities in comparison to picking up an ETF, which in many cases the spread on that ETF could be well trading with inside the spread of the individual constituents, the individual bonds inside that product, means that you can quickly and easily execute one trade that gives you exposure to hundreds or sometimes thousands of underlying constituents. So it's incredibly efficient and incredibly cost-effective. You make a very interesting point, but I'm also going to you know, quickly you know, um, talk about how active ETFs have been evolving. You, you, know, um, you made an important point about how active funds are using ETFs as building blocks and how you've actually worked with multiple teams to kind of bring in synergies within the ETF trading uh, world. But when you look at the way the mutual fund, the active traditional mutual fund space has been bleeding over the last five years in the equity space, but that clearly is not the trend, at least within the bond actively managed mutual funds. Whereas in the passive world with ETFs, you see there's a far more you know, uptake for passive uh, ETFs, passive fixed income ETFs. And clearly, active fixed income ETFs are growing as well, but not, not in, the same, uh, in the same pace as the others. So when do you think that move will happen? Because we saw in equities, it's happened already, where people are moving their capital from actively managed mutual funds into ETFs, the smart beta ETFs, how, how you want to call it. When do you think that, that I'd say, point of inflection is for, for fixed income? Uh, I mean, I'd say it's difficult to call at the moment. If you just to gain context, there's about $5 trillion invested in ETFs globally. About a trillion of that is in fixed income. Uh, if you think about the regions, around a trillion dollars is invested in dom uh, products domiciled in Europe. So that's just to give you some idea. The fixed income markets generally could be 100, 120 trillion, if you believe the PIMCO numbers. So that gives you some idea. At the moment, fixed income ETFs are a very small part of the overall universe, and so there's plenty of room for them to grow. Active ETFs, maybe about 100 billion, 110 billion dollars um, globally. So not a, not a small amount of money in absolute terms, but small relative. Um, but there's been a lot more, uh, I think we've seen, acceptance with regulators yeah. with, to get comfortable with the idea that you can have different types of strategies within that ETF wrapper. Because as you say, at the end of the day, the ETF is just a means to, to wrap those constituents and yeah. trade them like a stock. Yeah, Mark's absolutely right. It's a, it's a wrapper, it's a vehicle, it's a delivery mechanism uh, for a particular strategy, and that could be a passive index strategy and the bulk of the assets are there. Um, personally, I think we're at a li little bit of a, a crossroads with um, the assets that are in uh, passive fixed income ETFs and what can be done next, either in smart beta or active, um, non-transparent and in use its construct, um, what we've been looking at, which is active daily transparent, so they're research enhanced strategies or um, looking at strategic beta to, to enhance certain types of indices to, that can do better, such as uh, emerging market bonds. So, you know, we're very much of the, of the belief, and I'm of the belief, that uh, there is definitely a space for, for active strategies uh, in, the, in the fixed income ETF construct. I'm going to call them alpha-seeking strategies, and I'm no longer going to call it passive, we're going to call it index. Yep. The one thing everybody has to understand about fixed income, when you're dealing with index fixed income, it's not passive per se. You, ha you can't buy every bond every time you have a create or redeem or when you set up the fund. Your portfolio managers and your, and your risk systems are really critical to actually be able to manage the, the portfolio of assets to get as close to that benchmark as possible but it's not passive. There's a, there's a lot of work that goes into doing that. So that's why I'd say let, let's focus on the index. Um, on the alpha seeking, you know, I think it's really critical in terms of you know, the comment um, you made was around the daily transparency is critical. And, and that's where, if you think about the ETF wrapper itself, what's really key is that there are market makers who are making markets in these, not us, the banks, the APs, and some specific um, market makers who are non-banks, 
they're making markets in it, um, and they're actually keeping, and they help to keep basically the, the, uh, an ARB to a minimum, I would say, because if something gets far out of line, they're gonna ARB it, right? They're gonna either buy or sell to, to get the ARB. Um, they need to know what's in the portfolio to be able to do that. If they don't know what's in it, and if it's an alpha-seeking strategy where it's really protected IP, it's pretty tough to do that. So I don't know if you actually add much value with the wrapper, where you add it as if you are still providing, even if it's just a subset of the APs or the market makers with that information, so that they can actually make markets and help you to, to trade that, right? Is it, I guess a misconception. You see this in the press a lot, that the ETFs are index products. Well, no, they, they've just historically been used for index products, because let's just say, you create a, a simplistic ETF on UK gilts. Well, you can you clearly know against the index what the constituents are. That's totally transparent. And so, as an as an asset manager, you're happy f for the street to know what's in that product. If you're an active manager, a traditional long only, say, stock picking active manager or a bond picking active manager, you might not necessarily want to divulge your holdings on a daily basis because you might be giving up you know, your secret source, so to speak. Whereas an ETF, because it's traded on exchange throughout the day, needs a continuous price. And it needs market participants to therefore know what's in that product to be able to value it throughout the day. And that's the conundrum for, the, for an active manager. If, you've, if you're a high conviction active manager with a s sort of small number or concentrated portfolio, do you want to put that into an ETF and then tell everybody what's in it on a daily basis? And so this is something that regulators have been looking at as well as market participants. I maybe slightly cynically think also there's a lot of active managers that have watched that 1.4 trillion come out of their space and go into indexing and they've seen this huge run up in ETFs and thought, well, if we don't get into this, we're going to um, go the way of the dinosaurs. Well, I, I know you, you guys mentioned quite a, you know, Big, big numbers there, and I was actually going to act as though it was a surprise, just to make it a bit more dramatic. <laughs> but, but you know, given that I'm within the ETF space myself, I, I do believe that it's going to grow. You know, the, the doubling and, and the accelerated rate of growth doesn't, doesn't surprise me when you when you talk to clients on a day-to-day -day basis. But you know, moving on from there, you know, we, we've seen all these numbers come in. You know, the flows being positive and, and so on. But is this happening on a worldwide? Basis is, is this a worldwide phenomenon? Is it, or is it just U.S. centric or Europe centric? Now, if we think about it, um, this year, year to date, there have been over 200 billion going into fixed income ETFs globally, for all providers. In Europe, it's 55 billion, roughly. So, just over 20, well, right around 25 percent at this point in time. Um, so, it's it's not just U.S. centric. I would say it's global. But then remember. A lot of investors in APAC and LATAM can use either 40 Act or uh, USITS, to be perfectly frank, and they'll actually use the products that give them additional liquidity. Um, and so I would argue, if we look at the development of the marketplace, 40 Act and, and USITS, given now with MIFID II, that's actually helping all of us who have USITS ETFs to actually be able to show how they can actually be used um, in LATAM, in APAC versus the 40 Act, which there are some additional complications due to the holding tax that exists for 40 Act funds. So, so it's, a, it's a global phenomenon. Um, Europe, yes, we are behind where the U.S. is in terms of growth, but we also started a lot later you know, in terms of the development of the market. The U.S. market is quite a bit deeper, um, but we can potentially be selling the usage for ranges into a broader geographic base than, than I would argue in 40 Act yeah. will achieve. Yeah, it's essentially like a global brand. It's, it's, you know, that European regulatory regime is respected uh, in multiple regions, and so we see demand for those products outside of Europe. And that helps us, because that helps us build scale in the products, makes them more efficient, and then we can lower the cost. So it's actually beneficial to the European investor and to European issuers that our products are used in other regions. And I think we are seeing growth in Australia and Canada and, uh, and other parts of the world. And Latin America. Latin well, America, yeah. Funds, yeah, so. and some recent changes in yeah. Mexico and um, Brazil and, and then places like Chile and Colombia. Um, places that perhaps if you weren't in the industry, you wouldn't really appreciate that actually they're using, they're using European domiciled products. 
The one area I think that is a, a tough nut to crack is, is uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, China. Uh, that, that sort of region generally is, is, is pretty difficult. They're still very actively minded. The, the investors there are very stock story driven and pay very high costs. I mean, we actually had some feedback uh, when we were launching a product in Hong Kong that the price was too low and that people would not buy the product unless it had a higher price, <laughs> which for Vanguard was a difficult pill to swallow. <laughs> I, I wouldn't certainly blame it on the country, but probably because the mix of different types of investors that, that a country is made up of, right? So when we go and talk to a pension fund, they would say, oh, give me your ETFs as a building block. And, and when you go and talk to a wealth manager, it's, it's, it's for a completely different reason. And the choices they make in terms of what exposures they want are quite, quite varied depending on the type of client you're speaking to and which region. And in the UK, if you, you know, when we go pitch our thematic ETS, we speak to uh, the advisory audience, they're quite restricted because of platforms. Whereas that's not the case um, elsewhere. And if you take the Italian market dominated by tier two, tier three banks, they kind of act as an intermediary between between us as the issuers and the clients. So what do you think um, you know, is, is the contribution fr from different client base rather than just geography? I think yeah, oh, well, in, in the US, certainly there's been a far more of an even mix between institutional and, and retail, and I think that's been very well documented. Uh, in Europe, more to the, you know, the fund space, the institutional space in terms of the asset owners and we all are working very hard as an industry to, 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 to improve the, the retail participation. Um, in each individual country in Europe, you've got different platforms, different retail uh, protection in terms of what can and can't be done. Um, and we're just trying to educate, 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 whether that's with the regulator or the retail client and, and the platforms to, to upscale in the most part uh, a lot of technology. Uh, which is lagged behind in, in the retail platforms. It's interesting, when you start to think about it, just take that retail lens, it, it also shines a light again on another benefit, if you like, with ETFs. I mean, you, you sometimes find people who are in the industry, like ourselves, call them democratic products, because, because once they're listed, anybody can trade them. Uh, when you think about distributing funds into a country from an, an asset manager's perspective, you sometimes have to pay a local distributor to carry your funds. Now, that's something we don't like to do. Uh, in fact, it's one of the things we generally do, won't do. But an ETF is democratic because once it's listed on an exchange, anybody with a brokerage account can buy it. The other thing is, is if you think about it, there's one price. Unlike a traditional fund where you might have multiple share classes and there could be rebates and all sorts of non-transparent practices around what you're actually paying, with an ETF, if we go and buy it ourselves, we pay the same ongoing charge as a sovereign wealth fund that might put half a billion dollars into it. So that's incredibly democratic. And I still can't find, at least I've not come across another financial product where the same can be said, where an individual pays the same as a, you know, Saudi Aramco, for example. That's a, that's a very good point, um, there, Mark. Uh, but, yeah. Good, good, good numbers there. Um, great, great statistics as well. But I'd like to move on to our next point. Uh, you see four issuers sitting in front of you, and there are probably 20 or 30 more. Um, and clearly, billions of dollars is set to flow into these ETFs um, from from whatever you've heard so far. But, but of course, we can't just sit with a global ag, uh, a treasuries ETF, and, and wait for just investors to come and and pile in their money. There has to be some innovation that needs to happen, something, something that differentiates you know, BlackRock from Elgin or BlackRock from um, JP Morgan, for instance. So what's happening there? What, what are we offering to, to investors that, that's different to what they already have, apart from just getting into a price war? You know? All right, so when we look at it, um, we're constantly thinking about innovation. How do you actually create things that are, are useful for investors um, and provide solutions to them. And you know, one of the big things um, we focused on over here was how do we end up with uh, structures of ETFs that allow for FX hedging or accumulating structures within them that it, they, they maintain operational efficiency for the portfolio managers, but at the same time they're providing greater solutions for investors. So that was one of the big focuses that we had over here. 
Um, and there are some other providers who have that already in the US, I would argue, and can do things like that in the US. Um, and then if you move beyond that, you, you're constantly looking at, okay, what funds are actually gathering assets? Um, what are you hearing from investors? We have innovation teams, like all of us, who are focused in on how do I think about the next generation of uh, fixed income ETFs? How do I expand my suites? How do I think about ESG, uh, SRI, sustainable, because that's become more relevant? What does that actually mean for investors? What are the different parts of sustainable? Where do I want to be? Do I want to be on impact investing? Do I want to be um, thematics? Do I want to be just exclusionary screens? Or do I want screens and scores? So think about what you can provide them from, from that perspective. But at the same time, we all are careful, I would argue, about product proliferation. Because ultimately, with the ETF wrapper, what you want is you want a product that can be scaled so that there is natural secondary market liquidity in, in the product. And if I look at it, so six years ago, I think we had 84 fixed income ETFs. Today, I have 90. We've launched more than six. We've launched a lot more, but we've also closed some down. That we thought they just don't make sense in a longer period of time, so we, we close them down and try to, try to create things that are meaningful. So I would say ESGs become more important. Um, you know, China has become more relevant relevant for a lot of investors. How do you get access to a probably more difficult to access market? Um, and then you're always constantly trying to think about, you hear about smart beta in equities. How does that apply to fixed income? And I don't know about you guys, but I always think about fixed income. We already have macro factors at play, yeah, they're really factors. right? We've got duration, we've <laughs> yeah, got quality, we have ne yeah. negative convexity. Yeah. I think we already have these factors. We, we do all these different things. Yeah. That's what well, more do you need? Fixed income, isn't it? But you're constantly thinking about what else yeah. can you do? Yeah, I mean, it, and you know, new trends and things like that. Vanguard is, you know, we're very vanilla. Uh, we we th we sort of try to keep our ranges to a, to a core um, because of the client segments that we uh, we seek to um, we seek to service. But you know, when I look at the industry, being a fan of ETFs generally, and I step back, you know, there's some great sort of. Uh, new ways that you can sort of exploit different parts of the market um, through different types of niche products. Now, that's not something that you're going to find at Vanguard, but they're out there nonetheless. Um, I think innovation can take other forms as well. So in the US now, uh, in some cases, you can, you, know, you can have a range of 1,000 or so ETFs on a platform and you can trade them for nothing. I mean, you really think about that. You know, you, some of the costs are coming down to the, to the point made earlier that costs are almost, of the product, almost irrelevant. If a, if a product in the US costs you two and a half basis points, are you going to move it to a product that costs two? Probably not, actually, uh, unless you've got $5 billion at stake, which most investors don't. Um, but if you can trade a, a choice, a range of ETFs for nothing in terms of the actual transaction costs, I mean, that's incredible. So, and then I think we'll see more development, particularly in Europe, around solutions. So trying to put multi-asset strategies to get up, together and ETFs being the, the powering, the building blocks behind that yeah. so that you can develop you know, a personalised kind of global asset allocation model and then use ETFs to build it to suit your needs and just you know, yeah. trade it and move it around very cost effectively. We're seeing that with some of the new fintech providers that are coming in We've been working with a couple in Germany, and they're not interested at all in trading a, a traditional funds. They only are interested in ETFs, and they're concentrating on their technology and how they deliver their models to their clients. Yeah, well, one other thing that we've been seeing is that a part of innovation has kind of moved into index providers as well. So while, while we're working, say, in, in investment banking world, you, you end up going and pitching new ideas, but today you receive an email pretty much from every index provider for a new index, a new innovative um, idea that, that we can use to wrap it or, or, or into an ETF. But in the interest of time, I think we've got about five minutes or so left. We've got a couple of other questions we wanted to touch upon quickly around liquidity because that's quite topical, particularly uh, with, with what's happened in the recent past with Woodford and, and, and so on. So how do you think ETFs are going to help that, or you know, is it going to make it worse? Particularly because of the fact that we, we're seeing huge volumes of, uh, you know, money coming into ETFs, and and uh, you know, is that going to be helpful or, or not? So, do you, do you want to take it, Tom? Yes, I mean, when you when you strip it back, um, the ETF is as liquid as it's underlying. So when you look at um, the, the 
what uh, Anan said there in, in his example, you know, some of some of the items there were were quite illiquid. And when you look back at 2015 and uh, you know Third Avenue, which was a triple C rated junk bond um, uh, hedge fund, you know, when ETFs were compared and they're like the the were all of a sudden the whipping boy and what's going to happen to to uh, to ETFs, it, it it doesn't really work like that. We are constructing products with liquidity in mind, whether that be indexed or otherwise, to make sure that that the the, the ETF does exactly what it says on the tin. You know, if we're looking at rates ETFs, if we're looking at, at credit ETFs with investment grade, the index construction starts very much from a liquidity point of view and the strategy that it's trying to deliver. Well, let's go back to that. If you go back to 2013, or sorry, 2015 with Third Avenue, um, our flagship 40 act ETF, high yield ETF, was trading about 700, 725 million a day leading up to that. When they gated their fund, of course, we all were concerned, everybody was concerned, what is this going to do? What does this mean for the high yield market in, in general overall? And then how is that going to play in the ETF space? Um, and what we actually saw was that we ended up trading the next day over four um, billion traded uh, of the flagship ETF. Uh, and you ended up touching like right around 600 million of actual bonds. So you were trading multiples of risk without touching you know, the bonds themselves. That actually helped the market, right? People were actually able to go out and find, it was a price discovery type of, of mechanism. A number of us have calls for investors around what does this mean? What do we see going on with ETFs? I hosted one in Europe. Um, unfortunately, I found out three months later when I was talking to my discretionary managed account that actually owned the Third Avenue Fund in it, which made me laugh out loud. And I said, why the hell did we own this? And it was a whole different strategy. It, uh, there was a huge amount that was not rated. I think it was less than 50%, like not rated at all. And it was really an equity play using fixed income instruments. It was not a high yield fund, but people took it as a high yield fund. And you know, that's where we always have to be careful of how do you compare one type of a product to another? How do you compare, if I go back to the financial crisis, how do you look at CDOs of ABS versus CLOs? They're completely different animals. <laughs> They're not gonna perform the same way in that type of environment. Just like you, we were talking about vanilla ETFs, right? Most of us are doing more vanilla ETFs. They're not levered, they're not inverse, whatever. So we have to be careful that ETFs don't get tainted by an ETP that is not an ETF. And we, we all have to be careful with that as we talk about it and as we're in, in front of the yeah, press and make sure that's clear. Point. Thank you. Five trillion there are probably 200 products that have over 50% of that AUM and they're highly liquid, heavily diversified exposures. And the types of products that you find from, from out of the companies we represent uh, pay great attention to the underlying liquidity if you're going to invest into a market. A simplistic example would be an S&P 500 fund is ultimately as liquid as the $27 trillion that is the S&P 500 or the US equity market. So if you're looking at large, highly liquid underlying exposures. That ETF fishes in that entire pool. But the thing to remember with an ETF, unlike a mutual fund, if we're offering you mutual funds and you want to trade in and out of the mutual funds, you have to come to us and the fund managers have to then go and trade in the market. With an ETF, it's listed. You don't buy and sell off of us necessarily. You're secondary market trading. It's investor to investor. You're buying and selling amongst yourselves. And what you see is when there's spikes in market volatility, ETF trading goes up because it's capital markets. More people come to the market. And that trading takes place within the investors, to, to, within themselves. The portfolio managers rarely have to actually do much underlying trading. I would also argue, we, from a firm perspective, would argue that if you think about the bond market itself, you know, there's a modernization of the bond market going on right now. Um, similar to, I would argue, what happened in equities 20 years ago. You both were in equities, maybe not 20 years ago, but you've both been in equities. And the markets evolved. We would argue that fixed income ETFs or bond ETFs have helped to actually push the fixed income space to do more and more electronically um, through platforms, through a, like a market access to trade web or Bloomberg, these types of platforms. And that's actually helping to change the market, which we look at as, as a huge positive overall. Um, it's much better if you don't rely necessarily on the, the banks or the broker dealers to, to trade bonds. I think we're up to 50% of our trades tickets in fixed income are done uh, electronically. Now that's only 20% of the volume rough, rough, roughly, 
But that's a big change from years ago. Yeah, we've seen different market participants come in, uh, as, as, as Brett alludes to. It's not just the reserve of the investment banks anymore. The, the way the bond market trades has fundamentally changed. Uh, you've seen in the equity space many, many years ago, like basket trades, program trading. That's also come to the fixed income uh, market now as well, whether in a, you know, a principal risk perspective and also some firms um, more on the banking side who are trying to defend market share, bringing people together, more like bond networks, again, trading client to client to be able to do either baskets or individual bonds uh, on an agency uh, basis. So there's lots of different uh, innovation going on to help the underlying bonds to trade more, and that helps the, the ETF level as well because we all trade a, a, a lot of bonds in the creation redemption process when we have to. And particularly in the context of, say, for instance, UK equity markets, people prefer to buy it off secondary market for stamp duty purposes, right? You don't need to go and access the portfolio again, but you might as well just buy uh, an ETF that's already sitting in the inventory of one of the market makers or, or APs. But just to sort of wrap it up, you know, I just want to ask one final question, although it's not one of those that we initially discussed, you know, exactly going to surprise you. Um, so uh, j just to tie something in with product innovation, liquidity, and, and all the benefits that ETF is going to bring, if you have about, say, two or three things that investors should bear in mind, particularly in the context of, you know, some of the issuers going and doing more swap-backed ETFs or securities lending uh, increasing um, in, in an environment where everyone is facing pressures on their fees, you're looking for alternative sources of revenue. So if you were to say, say two or three points, half a minute each, what should investors bear in mind before we wrap, open the door for questions? I would maybe start with, you know, as you're investing, make sure you understand, and this is investing full stop, make sure you understand what is it that uh, the manager is trying to do from an outcome perspective. Um, understand the benchmark they're using and how they're able to actually track or beat that index, especially if they're alpha seeking, and, and make sure that you know, the benchmark they're using is actually applicable to what they're doing. So just be sensitive yeah. to eyes wide open. Yeah. You know what is actually happening. Um, the wrapper, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I would add to that from uh, when you're looking to select uh, any one particular ETF or any one particular ETF issuer is the, the cost control that, that that brings, whether you're trading a basket of bonds or equities or maybe just an individual ETF. I would look at liquidity of the underlying. Um, I would you know, challenge your uh, uh, market counterparties to, to help you with that, um, especially, and then on the third point, again, with the market counterparts, the ease of trading. Yeah, nothing really to add other than just look at the quality of the issuer. You know, it's understand what you're buying and who you're buying it from and what you're trying to achieve and don't pay too much. Great. Well, thank th th thank you very much. You? Well, I, I, was about to, I, was, I, was, I was going to anyway. Okay, <laughs> so I was going to. Um, so, well, of course, there's nothing much more to uh, okay. add. And I, I just wanted to say that I would echo all of their thoughts and they stole my thoughts even before I could. So, um, but, but in the interest of time, I, I rather just open the door for questions um, and, and take any, if you, if you have any. There you go. Right to your right. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I mean, how do you see the regulator evolving around the usage of ETF and new seats fund themselves? Are they any evolving perspective that the full look through, no look through, uh, any flexibility to relax the rules there? in terms of liquidity, in terms of all perspectives, so I don't know, just... I think from a, from a use its construct, from use its perspective, that we'd have to look to our home regulators for, for guidance there. Yeah. Um, we're you know, waiting for, uh, um, for that. And we've seen different movement in the US uh, towards favoring one or two different models, p potentially, and that's coming online. So yeah, I think it's wait and see in, in the use its construct from... Uh, from a European point of view? Yeah, I think it's fine. I think ETFs are good. They're transparent vehicles and they, they come with more added benefits when compared to your traditional mutual fund. But I, I would also you know, um, echo your point about the jurisdictions in the countries. If, if you take, for instance, Spain, you have certain capital gains tax benefits on, on, if you switch from one mutual fund to another, 
whereas you don't have the same for ETFs. It flipped uh, for a while, right? Exactly. It equalized it, and indeed. then somehow the local fund industry, I think, fought back and it's back to... In, indeed. You know, you, you need to, you know, take those considerations into account, you know, what are they doing to facilitate the general trading of, of these ETFs. Um, but as a vehicle, they, they promote transparency. Um, you know, the pricing is done independently. Everything is fully disclosed and, and so on. So for, for an investor, in my view, it's, it's a net benefit to actually access anything through an ETF. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for the discussion. You, you mentioned uh, um, high yield a couple of times, and I had a question on how do you see efficiency versus, for example, the uh, the iBox TRS that I traded, and uh, you could see that in multiple dimensions. Obviously, you have the bid offer, the transparency, OTC versus exchange, but you also have the, the efficiency in terms of uh, the cash that you have to put for the ETF versus the margining, and also the size that you can execute. So if you could comment on that. And, uh, well, sorry, one last point. Do you see uh, the iBox TRS, for example, as a competitor or a complementary to your, to your business? Well, it, it's interesting because you think about how are the banks hedging themselves um, when they're doing the TRS. And oftentimes, guess what they're using? They're using the ETF. So what you end up seeing is that um, if you are a, a player who uses or can use TRS, they can use ETFs, they can use any other derivative, whatever they might be doing. Uh, there are some participants who will actually say, you know what, I'm going to look at what's, what is most cost effective for me to use, depending on which way the banks are positioned on TRS. They may be more efficient to use, go long or short to TRS, or go long the ETF, or even potentially find the borrow of the ETF units and short those and create that same hedge. So people will. I would argue hedge funds are looking at that on a regular basis and trying to figure out how to best play that position. I don't know what you guys well, have arguably the, I mean, certainly that your high yield product has become the way the market looks at the market, isn't it? The ETF has become the barometer in some, in some respects for the professional market participants. Yeah, I think we, we touched on it before. It depends on what the client is trying to achieve, what the client can or can't do from a... Um, you know, a mandate or a guidelines perspective, they may be able to use TRS, they might not, they might need to use cash products, might be able to use derivatives. Um, yeah, they, I, they're complementary to each other, um, I believe. The, the, the actual lending of the ETF units has definitely increased in the usage range over the last five years. It's still not a, a huge thing, but it's, it's become more meaningful where custodians and holders are realizing that they can actually offset some of our, our TER, some of our charges, by actually lending out the units, and depending on what type of asset class it is, there's a pretty big benefit to, to offset um, you know, the TER that they're paying us. That helps to develop the market. And what we also see is that as um, the ecosystem around an ETF increases, so we're talking about if there is TRS on the same index as the ETF, if there are options on the ETF, if there's a lot of lending of the ETF units themselves, you actually see the benefit to the holders. It doesn't help any of us from, I would argue, an AUM perspective or an asset gathering perspective, but what it does is it helps the efficiency of the overall marketplace to actually tighten in the bid ask to be able to trade that ETF much more cost effectively. Anything else? Great, thanks for a very interesting panel. Great, great debate. Uh, we're just going to have a short, um, uh, you know, coffee break for about um, 15 minutes. Okay, thanks.